The Manchester Man by Mrs. George Linnaeus Banks Chapter 28 Once in a Life Customs change with the manners of the times, and as the apprentice is no longer the absolute bond-slave of his master, released from the seven years' bondage, is now seldom accompanied by the active and noisy demonstration which of old marked that epoch of a tradesman's or artisan's career. But if the sudden uproar which chased quiet from the precincts of Mr. Ashton's warehouse and manufactory when the infirmary clock told noon broke prematurely upon the conference in the counting-house, it was not unexpected. Every apprentice had been similarly greeted at the same period of his life. Until the clock proclaimed twelve, business routine had been undisturbed, but those twelve beats of the timekeeper's hammer had been the signal for every apprentice and workman on the premises to rush pell-mell into the yard each bearing with him some implement or symbol of his trade, anything which would clash or clang, being preferred. Remnants of fringe, bed lace and carpet binding waved and fluttered like streamers from the hands of the women. Umbrella sticks were flourished, strings of waist ferrules, brass wheels, brace buckles, button and tassel moulds, cocks and spindles were jingled and jangled together. Tin cans were beaten with picking rods, punches, hammers, leather stamps, and other tools by apprentices and men, whilst Jabez himself hoisted on the shoulders of the two small ware weavers who had seized and borne him from his master's presence, claiming him as one of their own body, a recognised lawful member of their craft, was paraded round and round that inner courtyard with a crowd in extemporised procession amid shouts, hurrahs, songs, and that peculiar instrumental accompaniment which was noise, not music. The household servants had crowded to the scullery door. Clark stood aloof under the gateway, where Simon Clegg kept them in company, in an ecstasy of satisfaction. Mr. and Mrs. Ashton and Mr. Chadwick surveyed the proceedings from the counting-house window while Stephen Ellen and Augusta were curious enough to look on from those back hall steps where they had once before received the hero of that scene, wounded from a very different one. More than six years had elapsed since the last indoor apprentice had been born in triumph round that yard, Kit Townley's indentures had been prematurely cancelled, and Jabez may be pardoned if he contrasted the two occasions and construed the wilder excitement and enthusiasm of this in his own favour, when his employers and their daughter noticed it also. It is easy to tell what a favourite Jabus must be in the warehouse by the uproar. The last outcome, I remember, was quite tame beside this. Well, Augusta, answered Ellen, I believe he deserves it. I know my father thinks there is not such another young man as Mr. Clegg in all Manchester. Yes, he's very kind, and obliging, and clever, and persevering, and all that, and I like him very well. But then you know, Ellen, he is not a gentleman, and he is not handsome by any means, responded Augusta in quite a patronising tone. Ellen looked grave. He is all that is good and noble, if he was not born a gentleman, and I think him handsome. He has a frank, open, expressive countenance, and a good figure, and good manners, and what more would you have? Augusta turned her head sharply, and looked up archly in her cousin's face. It's well Captain Travers does not hear you, Helen, or he might be jealous of the prentice knight, she said banteringly. Ellen coloured painfully. When shall I make you understand that Mr. Travis is nothing to me? asked she. When my cousin makes me understand that she is nothing to Mr. Travis, was the quick reply, as Jabez was being borne past for the last time, and the young ladies once more waved their handkerchiefs in salutation. It may be very gratifying and very triumphant to be borne aloft on other men's shoulders, but it is neither dignified nor graceful nor comfortable, and Jabez, being carried off bareheaded, 
had neither hat nor cap to wave in return. He made the best use of his right hand, his left being required to steady himself. Yet, I am afraid, he was more desirous to make a good impression on the romantic young lady muffled in a shawl to hide the swathing bandages than on his less attractive and elder champion by her side. It was half past twelve, the dinner bell rang, Jabus was lured to terra firma, and there was a general rush to the packing room, which had been cleared out to receive trestles and planks for the tables, and an abundant supply of cold meat, cheese, bread and ale, provided by the master, and then and there before a mouthful was cut, Mr. Ashton standing at the head of the table, having Mr. Chadwick by his side and Simon Clegg close at hand, presented Jabus with his indentures, with many expressions of his good will and his good opinion, and an intimation to those assembled that Mr. Clegg would, in all probability, continue in his employ, an announcement which was received with loud acclaim, and the hungry operative set to at the collation with right good will. This was the master's feast, that of the apprentice for which it was customary to save up long in advance was at night, and held at the neighbouring Concert Hall Tavern in York Street, opposite to the then Gentleman's Concert Hall. Prior to that, however, Mrs. Ashton had somewhat to say to the young man, and she chose his own sitting-room to say it in. Of course his apprenticeship over, it behoved him to shift his quarters, and he had looked forward to his abdication with regret undreamed of by Mrs. Ashton, or oh, she would certainly have hesitated, ere she made the proposal she did. As it was, she kindly and thoughtfully considered that Jabus had no good parental home to return to, that she had no other use for the rooms he occupied, so she proposed to him that he should continue to occupy them, whilst he thought fit, since he had elected to remain in their service. He had already looked at lodgings in Charlotte Street close at hand, but this unexpected proposal came like a reprieve to an exile, and he was as prompt in his acceptance as he had been in that previous decision which had so thoroughly swamped all Mr. Chadwick's plans for his advancement. His eager, Oh, madam, you cannot mean it. You overwhelm me with kindness. Remain under this roof. It's a privilege I had not anticipated, and I shall be proud to embrace it sent Mrs. Ashton away well pleased. It was doubly satisfactory to find the comforts of their home appreciated after seven years' experience, and to be able to refute Mr. Ashton's theory that all young men like to shake a loose leg, and Jabus would be too glad to escape from grumbling Kezia's jurisdiction to accept the offer. Mr. Ashton, however, did not abandon the opinion he had formed. I'll wager my gold snuff-box against a button mould, asserted he, that Clegg only said yes because gratitude would not let him say nay. It's not likely a young man would care to be always under the eyes of a master or mistress, however steady he may be. Ah, but neither Mr. nor Mrs. Ashton knew there was a magnet under their roof, stronger than all the ordinary inducements which might otherwise have drawn him away, and perhaps it was as well for him they did not. Simon, who was present at the time, seemed literally overpowered with gratitude for all the good which was falling into the lap of the child of his adoption. He, however, took his own views of the matter, views not calculated to puff Jabus up in his own esteem, and when Mrs. Ashton was gone, he broke out. He, Javis, lad, but thou's lit on thy feet. Thou's been a good lad, I reckon, and thou's served thy master greatly. But thou's seen many a lad does that, as never gets a lift such as thou's getting. And I canna but think it all comes of that prayer of thy Israelite namesake, as I taught thee, when thou were no bigger than sixpenneth a copper. And I've forgotten it, I hope. No, Jabus had not forgotten it. It would be strange if he had. Nay, only that morning, in the flush of success, 
he had carried from the counting house with the buoyant presumption of youth the conviction that it was not so much a prayer as a prophecy nearing fulfilment simon brought his soaring pinions down from their icarian flight well lad it may be the lord has enlarged thy coast but if so be he am thou sees there's more room for thee to slip as well as to stand and there's more reason why thou should be thankful and humble for the big boot says let him that standeth take heed lest he fall and i shouldn't have liked to see thy young yed turn with pride his lecture was somewhat of a cold shower bath to jabez in his hour of triumph but no doubt it was salutary in its ultimate effects at all events it kept the vaulting ambition of the new man a little in check people especially work people then observed early hours at seven o'clock the outcome supper was on the tables at the concert hall tavern and the elder apprentices and all such of the workmen as were absolutely engaged on the premises were there to partake when jabez found old simon a seat himself taking the head of the table with the two senior apprentices on his right hand and left the cost of such suppers usually fell on the apprentice but sometimes as in this case the master added his quota if plain the provision was substantial and ample rounds of beef and legs of mutton piles of floury potatoes and red cones of carrot and pale beds of mashed turnip smoked on the board and the two-pronged forks and horn-hafted knives were flanked with earthenware jugs and horns of ale it was the first essay of jabus in the art of carving and no doubt he made rather an unskilled president but in the then condition of the lower classes a large joint of meat was a rare sight to a working man and so he cut away with no fear of critics amidst the rattle of cutlery and crockery and the rapid play of jaws beef and mutton disappeared and were succeeded by a tremendous plum pudding the contribution of old mrs clues and half a cheese which came to the table in the then common japan receptacle locally known as a cheese biggin appetite and the viands fled together the noise of tongues succeeded to the noise of knives and forks and lancashire humour vented itself in jest and repartee sometimes coarse but seldom mischievous old simon enjoyed it immensely it seemed like a renewal of his own youth it was not, however, until the supper table was cleared that the chief ceremonial of the evening took place. Then an armchair was mounted upon the table in which Jabez was enthroned, the two eldest apprentices standing also on the table on either hand as supporters. An immense bowl of steaming punch was brought in, which was held over the head of Jabez by the one apprentice when he was said to be crowned, whilst the other wielding the punch ladle as a symbol of authority with many a theatrical grimace began to ladle the odorous compound into the glasses of the guests and the head overlooker of the manufactory from the opposite end of the table prepared to propose the health of the late apprentice as a new member of their craft at this juncture in walked their master mr ashton closely followed by mr chadwick leaning on the arm of the reverend joshua brooks who with many a pish and pshaw and poo had professed to come reluctantly to see a sensible lad made a fool of himself their entrance and the volley of cheers which greeted it made a momentary pause in the proceedings then mr ashton being duly supplied with a ladle full of punch took his overlooker's place and the glass serving as a substitute for his snuff box he proposed and drank mr clegg's health and prosperity and welcomed him among the confraternity of small ware weavers this was succeeded by a prolonged cheer and then as one by one each man's glass was filled ere he touched it with his lips he sang separately with whatsoever voice he might happen to have 
musical or otherwise, the following toast to proclaim the released apprentice a freeman of the trade, the chorus being taken up afresh after every repetition of the quatrain. Here's a health to he that's now set free, that once was apprentice bound, and for his sake this merriment we make, so let his health go round, go round, go round, go round, brave boys, until it comes to me, for the longer we sit here and drink, the merrier we shall be. Mr. Ashton had ordered up another bowl of punch, and that being distributed with light ceremony over the new small air monarch's head, Jabus, from his temporary throne, with all the warmth of freshly stimulated gratitude, delivered a very genuine oration on the excellence of the master then present, and proposed as a toast, Mr. and Mrs. Ashton, our worthy and esteemed master and mistress. Nowadays I'm afraid the master would have been dubbed a governor, and the mistress ignored altogether. But, though it is only fifty-five years since, servants were not ashamed to own they had masters and mistresses, and consequently were not above being amenable to rule. During this digression, at a hint from someone, I believe old Simon, Jabez, whose eloquence must surely have come from the punch bowl, dilated on the spiritual relation between the reverend chaplain and the party assembled, there being scarcely an individual present who had not been either baptised or married by the reverend Joshua Brooks, and he wished health and long life to him with much sincerity. A general shout rose in response, but Joshua made no other reply than to turn on his heel, the better to hide his face and growl out, Long life indeed, <clears throat> pack of tomfoolery, as he hurried from the room, before either Mr. Ashton or his paralysed brother-in-law could follow. Yet, in spite of his gruff disclaimer, he added another bowl of punch to the tomfoolery, at least one was brought in soon after, and no one there was called upon to pay for it, Relieved from the restraining presence of the gentlemen, tongues wagged freely, long pipes were introduced, song, jest and toast succeeded each other, and, as the fun grew and the smoke thickened, they mingled confusedly, until at length clear-headed Simon drew his arm through that of the novice, and, watching his opportunity, led him unnoticed into the hope and air with his head spinning like a teetotum. Jabus awakened the next morning with a terrible headache, and a dim recollection of having encountered stately Mrs. Ashton in the hall overnight, when the very statues had seemed to shake their heads at him, and her mild, Fie, Jabus, followed him upstairs, apparently carpeted with moss or india rubber for the nonce, it was his first dissipation, and his last. He never forgot it, and if anything was wanting to destroy the germs of self-sufficiency and elation, it was found in the consciousness of his own frailty and the sense of shame and self-reproach it engendered. Experienced as knew that the surrounding fumes of liquor and tobacco had been more potential than the small quantity of punch he had imbibed, but he did not know it, and by the hail fellow well metishness of those workmen who were most inclined at all times to keep St. Monday, and who came to their work, or stayed from their work, unfit for their work, was a sensitive chord of his nature struck, far more than by the quiet caution of Simon, the light badinage of Mr. Ashton, or the jeers of captious Kezia. In making light of it, Jabez felt they made light of him, and he was long after afraid, lest those whose opinion he held in esteem should make light of him also. Augusta Ashton, chief of these. Chapter 29 On Hardwick Green Pond 
It was in vain Madame Broadbent waited on Mr. and Mrs. Chadwick and solicited Miss Ashton's return to her establishment on her ultimate recovery. The pupil was not more shudderingly reluctant to be replaced under her despotic rule than the parents were peremptory in their refusal. When her plea for the maintenance of discipline failed and she tried cajolery as ineffectually, she gave way to the expression of her natural fears that it would be the ruin of the academy if Mr. Ashton did not reverse his decision. He loved his daughter too well to yield, and Mrs. Broadbent went back to Bradshaw Street to find, as years rolled on, that she had been a true prophetess. The injury done to Miss Ashton's collarbone had been bruited about, and slowly but surely it helped to sap the foundation of the once flourishing seminary. It continued to exist for some years, but its prestige was gone, its glory departed. Yet, she maintained her personal importance to the last, and exhibited her flock in the lower boxes of the Theatre Royal on Mrs. McGibbon's benefit nights, with undiminished dignity through successive seasons. The rapidly ripening young lady had her will. She had done with the schoolroom forever, but her lessons on the harp from Mr. Horribin and on the piano from George Ware, the leader of the gentlemen's concerts, came under quite another category, nor did she think it beneath her aspirations to retain her place in Mrs. Allen's fashionable dancing room, where she practised cotillons, quadrilles, and the newly imported waltz, with partners on a par with herself. But these were accomplishments, and we all know, or ought to know by this time, that accomplishments require much more prolonged and arduous application than the merely useful and essential branches of knowledge, theorists for the higher education of women, notwithstanding. Miss Augusta was desirous to be captivating and shine in society, and so proud was Mr. Ashton of his beautiful daughter that he fell in readily with the expansive views of the incipient bell and new steps or new melodies were paraded for his gratification week by week. But Mrs. Ashton, telling her daughter that knowledge was light of courage, sent her to Mr. Mabbott's to take lessons in cookery and confectionery, and into the kitchen to put them in practice under the eye of Kezia, and exercise being good for health, according to the same sensible mother, she was required to assist in bed-making, furniture polishing, dusting, and general household matters, for which the young lady had little liking, and was not to be spurred into liking by any citation of her cousin Ellen's qualifications in these respects. She preferred to dress with all the art at her command, to make her beauty more bewildering, and to take her place at harp or piano or embroidery frame, ready to receive visitors, either with or without her mother, and to be as fascinating as possible, especially when Lawrence Aspinall was the caller. Or she would sit in dishabille in the retirement of her own chamber, and read Moore and Byron, because they were tabooed, and the handsome lieutenant quoted them so enchantingly, while Cicely, who had something to answer for in this respect, bustled about and overworked herself, to spare her darling Miss Augusta, who, with all her faults, must have been a loving and lovable creature to win such devotion from a dependent. It happened that the young lady received visitors alone more frequently than was desirable, Mrs. Ashton being usually tied to the warehouse in consequence of the interest Mr. Ashton took in the establishment of the Manchester Chamber of Commerce and in the project for the widening of Market Street and other of the cramped thoroughfares of the growing town, which necessarily took him much from home and his private business, to say nothing of the excitement consequent on the trial of Queen Caroline during its long progress. But the year 1820, which had opened only to close the long volume of George III's life, and to open that of George IV's reign at a chapter of regal wife persecution, which as few parallels, had itself grown old and died, and 1821 had thrust itself prominently forward. It came with a white robe and a frost-bitten countenance, which grew sharper and more pinched as weeks and months went by. It looked down on the currents of rivers and canals, 
On the secluded still waters of Strangeways Park, the oblong pond in front of the infirmary, an elite-shaped lakelet within the area of Adwick Green, until their ripples curdled under the chilling glance of the new year. Sterner grew its aspect as the shivering weeks counted themselves into months, and the shrinking water spread first a thin film, then a thick and a thicker barrier of ice between them and the freezing atmosphere. Every gutter had its slide, along which clattering clogs sped noiselessly, every pool its vociferous throng of boys, and every pond its mingled concourse of skaters and sliders. Of these, the infirmary and Hardwick Green waters were most patronised, the former having the more numerous, the latter having the more select body of skaters, and consequently the more fashionable surrounding of spectators. The amusements of the town were then on so limited and exclusive a scale that long frost was quite a boon to the younger portion of the community, and, during the sixteen weeks of its continuance, the green became a promenade, gay with the warm hues of feminine attire, as ladies flocked to witness and extol the feats of husbands, brothers, cousins, or particular friends. There was no fear of vulgar overcrowding, except on Sundays. Working hours were long, and there were no Saturday half-holidays, so that only those whose time was at their own disposal could share the sport or overlook it. Amongst these, much to the annoyance of Mr. Aspinall, his son Lawrence chose to enrol himself, with less regard to the fluctuation of the cotton market, or the comparative value of American or East Indian staples, than the Cannon Street merchant thought necessary to fit him for his future partner or successor. The younger man had chosen to construe liberally the word gentleman, which had been the be-all and end-all of his training, and to regard elegant idleness as its synonym. What availed his fine figure and proficiency in arts and athletics, if he had no opportunity for the display of his person or his skill, and to throw away the rare chance the winter provided, was clearly to scorn the gift of the gods. Accordingly, he spent more time on Ardwick Green Pond than in the counting house, buried occasionally with a visit to the assembly billiard room in Bat Mosley Street, or a morning promenade in the infirmary gardens, from the open gates of which he generally contrived to emerge as Miss Ashton descended the steps from Mr. Mabbott's, and just in time to hand her courteously and daintily across the roadway and bear her company to her own door, discoursing of recent assemblies or concerts, from the former of which she had hitherto been debarred, and of the last occasion on which she had the exquisite pleasure of seeing her at Arbit Green, occasions which were seldom reported at home, any more than the chance meetings on her way from Mr. Mabbott's, and the retinence, be sure, boded no good. Dr. Hull had long ago advised outdoor exercise for the rapidly growing girl, and there was no embargo on her walks abroad. Mrs. Ashton suspecting no danger, and no surreptitious meetings. Her visits to the green during the long skating season were quite as unrestrained, except that an escort became a necessity. Occasionally a mother accompanied her, sometimes Mrs. Walmsley and John. Then there was generally a nurse and baby in the rear. Sometimes Ellen and Mrs. Chadwick and Augusta had always returned so exhilarated by her country walk and so delighted with all she had seen that once or twice when impressive business withheld Mrs. Ashton from bearing her daughter company, as promised, rather than disappoint, the lady had made Mr. Clegg her deputy an honour on which he perhaps set far too high a value. Mrs. Ashton would have drawn herself up with double dignity, and repudiated as an insult the suggestion of any other of their salesmen or clerks as an escort for her beautiful daughter. But Jabez lived in the house, had lived there so long, had even from her childhood been the girl's frequent guardian, and proved himself so worthy of the trust that she committed her to his care now much as of old, and perhaps all the more readily because she saw, or fancied she saw, a disinclination on Mr. Augustus' part to be so accompanied. In March the cold was as intense as in January, and Miss Ashton as eager to watch the skaters. One afternoon, towards the close of the month, when the breaking up of the frost was anticipated, 
Quite a family party had gone to the green, wrapped in fur-trimmed palaces of velvet or woolen, with fur-rimmed hats and muffs. It was not yet closing time, when Mr. Ashton, always disposed to be friendly with Jabez, accosted him. The ladies are gone to the green, Clegg. Suppose you lend me an arm along the slippery roads, and we go to meet them, eh? The sparkling eyes of Jabez confirmed his ready tongues with pleasure, sir, as sensible of the honour done him. He left the sail room, whistled his black friend Nelson from the yard, and they set off at a brisk pace to keep the blood in circulation, the dog leaping, bounding, and barking before them in token of good fellowship. As they passed the infirmary pond, Jabez remarked that the ice began to look watery, to which Mr. Ashton replied, Yes, I think Jack Frost's long visit is near its end, and there must be some truth in the old saw that a thaw is colder than a frost. At that moment Mr. Aspinall's carriage rolled past them, bearing the merchant onwards in distinguished state. Private carriages were by no means common. Whereat Mr. Ashton observed with a shrug, how pride punishes itself. Fancy a tall fellow like Mr. Aspinall cramped up in a stifling box upon wheels on a day like this, when he has the free use of his limbs. Contrary to expectation, they did not come in sight of the ladies until they gained the green, which they found a scene of wild hubbub and commotion. Skaters and spectators gathering towards the centre of the green, whence came a confused noise of voices, shouting, crying and screaming. The quick eye of Jabus was at once arrested by the figure of Augusta on the opposite bank, the centre of an appalled group wringing her hands in that very impotence of terror, and as he penetrated the excited crowd he saw the hatless head of a man whose body was submerged, resting with its chin upon a ledge of the ice which had apparently broken under him. At the first glance he failed to distinguish the head from the distance and rushed forward, apprehensive lest it should be that of either Mr. Walmsley or his friend Travis, whom he knew to be of the party. Recognition came, accompanied by a shock that staggered him. If the ice had attractions for Aspinall and Wormsley, Ellen Chadwick had certainly as great attractions for Ben Travis, but it is certain that neither cousins, nor mothers, nor aunt were sensible that they had been drawn thither simply as a sort of decorous train to Miss Augusta Ashton, whose inspiriting had in turn been the fascinating lieutenant the most graceful and accomplished skater on the pond. Perhaps she hardly knew it herself, not being given to searching her own heart for its motives, but a hint from him had set her longing for another sight of the skating before the chance was gone, and her imperative will, no less than her persuasive voice, had swayed the rest. Lawrence had made the most of the occasion, glad of an opportunity to cultivate the acquaintance of the whole family and display his graceful figure and his skill to the best advantage. Now and then he joined the Chadwicks and the Ashtons on the bank, and on darted off, wheeling hither and thither, so swift in his evolutions the eye could scarcely follow him. Amongst the skaters the man and his feet stood out. He was the observed of all observers, and not vainer was he of his accomplishments than was Augusta at being singled out for attention in the face of so many damsels of his acquaintance, all, as she foolishly supposed, equally desirous to bask in the sun of his smile. A small match will kindle a large flame if combustibles be there. Fired by her too apparent satisfaction and Mrs. Ashton's presence, his excessive vanity induced him to perform what, with the imperfect skates of the period, was a distinguished feat. He was ordinarily proud of his calligraphy. Now he wound and twisted, lifted his skates or dashed them down until he had scored upon the ice an alphabet in bold capitals. But whether he had miscalculated his space or the strength of the ice, broken into for the use of cattle at the upper end, or the crowd of inquisitive or envious followers, had been too great for its resistance. As he made the last curl of the letter Z, the ice gave way, and he was plunged in up to the neck amid the shrieks of women and the shouts of men. 
His chin had caught upon the ice with a stunning blow, but it rested there, and aided by the buoyancy of the water beneath, upheld him until, with returning sense, he struggled to bring his shoulders above the surface and upheave himself. He trod the water, and it sustained him, but the ice would not. He was forced to content himself with the use of his hands beneath as paddles to relieve the pressure on his chin and wait for help which seemed an eternity in coming. He had been in the water some time when Jabez and Mr. Ashton appeared on the scene, amongst women shrieking with affright and men rushing about without presence of mind or paralysed to powerlessness. Mr. Travis alone appeared to have a thought, and he had sent for ropes and hatchets to cut away to him through the ice itself. But there was a question, would his strength hold out? Will no one save him? Will no one save him? cried Augusta piteously. Fifty pounds to him who will save my son, was the cry of the frantic father who had witnessed the accident from his own carriage window. A hundred, two hundred pounds, five hundred pounds to anyone who will save him. It's known a better use, Meister, said a working man with a shake of his head. Men want to chuck their lives away for brass, and yon ice is like a pane of glass with a stone through it. Unfortunately, impulsive Ben Travis had darted forward to his rescue at the outset, and his ponderous way to crack the already broken ice in all directions. He had himself retreated with difficulty, and now no offers of reward would tempt men to put their own lives in peril, though Kit Townley was there, urging others to the attempt, and Bob, the ex-groom, had rushed for ropes they had neither pluck nor skill to use since a noose cord flung like a lasso would have strangled him. "'Oh, save him, save him, Jabus!' implored Augusta, as he and her father came up. Jabus looked at her strangely. His head seemed to spin. His face went livid as that on the ice. Had this secret devotion no other end than this? True, she had called him Jabus, but so she had called him in his servitude. She had appealed to him as one she trusted in, implicitly, but the appeal sounded as made for one she loved, and that was not himself, but he who, as boy and man, had wounded him in soul and body. The very tone of her cry was as a knell to his hopes and himself. It was his foe and his rival who was perishing. Was he called upon to risk his life to warm a serpent to sting him again? The conflict in his breast was sharp and terrible. If thine enemy hunger, give him food, seemed to float in his ears. There was a small gloved hand on his arm, a pale sweet face looking up into his. The moments were flying fast. Oh, Jabez, Jabez, do try. I will, said he hoarsely. Had he not often declared in his secret heart that he would give his life to serve her? and should he be ungenerous enough to shrink now? "'It is folly to attempt, I forbid it!' exclaimed Mrs. Ashton, laying her hand on his arm. And Ellen Chadwick, pale as Augusta, tried to stop him with, "'You must not, you must not, you will perish!' Even strangers from the crowd warned him back, but he was gone, ere Mrs. Chadwick softly recalled her daughter to herself. "'Hush, Ellen, this is not seemly. Mr. Clegg, will attempt nothing impossible. He hurried to the side nearest Lawrence, calling to him, Keep up, help is coming. As for ladders, gave a word or two of instruction to Mr. Ashton and Travis, sent Nelson on the ice to try its strength, secured a rope round his own waist, then, lying flat on the cold ice, cautiously felt his way to the farther side of Aspinall, whose eyes were closed, and whose strength was ebbing fast. He hardly heard the words of cheer, addressed to him. Two long ladders had been lashed side by side to give breadth of surface. These, by the help of Cords and Nelson, whose sagacity was akin to reason, he drew across the cracked and gaping ice, and crept slowly from rung to rung, watched from the land breathlessly, until he reached his almost insensible rival. With rapidly benumbing fingers, he secured strong ropes beneath its shoulder, sending Nelson back to the bank with the main line, in case his own strength was insufficient to lift the dead weight of Lawrence, or that the ice should yield beneath the double weight. 
Someone sent a brandy flask back by the dog. Can you swallow? he asked. There was no answer but a gurgle. He moistened the blue lips while the head bent slightly back, introduced a small quantity of the potent spirit between his set teeth, and, having warmed himself by the same means, essayed to lift the freezing skater, who was almost powerless to aid. But the latter, with an extreme effort, raised an arm above the ice and grasped recumbent Jabus. And now Nelson proved his worth. He set his teeth in Aspinall's high coat collar and tugged until their united strength drew him upwards and across the ladder sledge, almost as stiff and helpless as a corpse. To lessen the weight, Jabus crept from the ladders. They were drawn to the side with their living freight before he himself was out of danger for the heavy pressure and the swift motion set the ice cracking under him, and with extreme difficulty he dragged himself to the bank to sink down on the hardened snow, overcome by the strain of mind and muscle, whilst the approving crowd set up a shout, and Augusta Ashton thanked him tremulously. "'I'm afraid, Clegg, you've spent your strength for a dead man,' said Travis, grasping his hand warmly. And Aspinall was scarcely worth it, alive or dead. But Jabus made no reply. He rose slowly and painfully, shook off the congratulatory crowd of strangers and friends on the plea of needing to warm and dry himself, refused point blank to accept the grateful hospitality of Mr. Aspinall, and, taking the proffered arm of Travis, turned towards the Georgian dragon, as little like one who had done a noble action as could be imagined. Mr. Ashton followed, tapping his gold snuff-box in wonder and perplexity. He saw that something was wrong, but knew not that Augusta's hasty thanks had closed the young man's heart against all but its own pain. Chapter 30 Blind So white, so cold, so still, was the rigid figure borne from the pond to Mr. Aspinall's house. Travis might well count him a dead man, as the rumour rang concerning him, and feeble old Kitty sent up a lamentation as over the dead. Mrs. Ashton, who knew that to be a home without a thinking woman at its head, volunteered her services, and entered the house with the bearers, leaving the trembling Augusta with their friends. She gently put the old woman aside, and felt pulse and heart. There is life, said she, and while there is life, there is hope. Keep tears until there is time to shed them. Now we must act. Then, turning to the scared and scurrying servants, she gave her orders, much as though she'd been in her own warehouse, and with a stately authority, there was no disputing. The butler was bidden to bring brandy quick. The footman was required to wheel his sofa to the fire and pile up the coals. A maid was asked for hot blankets without delay, and moaning Kitty was set to work to help to strip her young master and chafe his limbs. And so promptly were her clear, cool orders obeyed, that when the doctor arrived in hot haste with Mr. Aspinall, half his work was done. The pulse had quickened and the limbs began to glow, though the eyelids remained closed. Most grateful then was Mr. Aspinall for the efficient matronly service rendered to his motherless boy by the stately lady, who was drawn nearer to him in his helplessness by her own kindly act than by all the conciliatory visits and peace offerings with which Lawrence had himself sought to propitiate her, and for once Mr. Aspinall accepted a kindness as a favour, not as a tribute to his personal importance and he placed his carriage at the disposal of Mr. Ashton and herself for their return home without a sign of his usual self-inflation. His importance received a considerable shock, however, when he called at the house in Mosley Street the following day to report progress and relieve himself of his obligation to his son's preserver by paying over the five hundred pounds he had in his extremity offered as a reward. I do not think Mr. Clegg will accept a reward, said Mr. and Mrs. Ashton in a breath. Not accept it? And the portly figure seemed to swell. Five hundred pounds is a large sum for a young man in his position. Only a fool or a madman would refuse it. Just so, just so, 
replied Mr. Ashton, offering his open snuff-box to his visitor, whilst Mrs. Ashton stirred the fire as a sort of dubious disclaimer. But I think, for all that, you will find we are right. Mr. Clegg is not a common man, and is not actuated by common motives. My dear, he nodded, and Mrs. Ashton pulled the bell rope. Mulberry suited James, answered on the instant. Mr. Clegg is wanted. Mr. Clegg, labouring under the disadvantage of a cold caught the previous afternoon, to which any huskiness of voice might be attributed, obeyed the summons. He was presented duly to Mr. Aspinall, and much to that gentleman's surprise, was invited to take a seat. Absolutely invited to take a seat, as he afterwards recounted in indignation to a friend. These Whigs have no respect for a gentleman's feelings. Nor had Jabus. He was pale enough when he entered, but his face flushed, his lips compressed, and the scar on his brow showed vividly as Mr. Aspinall drew forth a roll of crisp banknotes from his pocket book and loftily offered to him the reward he had earned by his bravery. He flushed, put back the notes with a movement of his hand, and said coldly, You owe me nothing, sir. The meanest creature on God's earth should have freely given such service as I rendered to your son. I cannot set a price on life, but I offered the reward, and the fact is I must discharge the debt. Reconsider, young man. It is a large sum. Many a man starts the world with less. A large sum to pay for your son's life? Half a mine, sir, interrogated Jabus, drawing himself up stiffly, adding, without waiting for a reply, I do not sell such service, sir. You owe me nothing. Let your son thank Miss Ashton for his life. He is her debtor, not mine. The words seemed to rasp over a nutmeg grater they came so hoarsely, as did his request for leave to withdraw, and he closed the door on the five hundred pounds, and on the smiles of husband and wife, before the rebuffed cotton merchant could master his indignation to reply. The notes in his palm were light enough, but lying there they represented liberality, condemned, a debt unpaid, an undischarged obligation to an inferior, and not thrice their value in gold could have pressed so heavily on Mr. Aspinall as that last consideration. The frigid manner of Jabus he construed into radical impudence. He resented the salesman's repudiation of reward as a personal affront, and did not scruple to express his views openly then and there, winding up with a question which startled his interlocutors. What did the singular young man mean by his reference to Miss Ashton? Had they followed the singular young man across the hall to the sanctuary of his own sitting-room, seen him dash himself down into a chair and bury his head in his hands on the table with unutterable anguish on his face, and heard burst from his lips more as a groan than embodied thought, Oh, Augusta, adored Augusta, what a presumptuous madman! I have been. They would but have had half the answer, but had they mounted the polished oaken stairs to the dainty chamber where Augusta Ashton lay in bed with a cruel headache brought on by the fright and eyes red with weeping at the catastrophe which had befallen her adorable admirer, the gallant lieutenant, and heard her half audible lamentations, the answer might have been complete. Mrs. Ashton had heard Augustus' frantic appeal to Jabus at the pond, had seen him stagger and turn livid as if shot, noted the inward struggle ere he said, I will, but she had ascribed it to old and unforgiven injuries, and, thinking it hard that he should be called upon to hazard his life for his known enemy, with chances so heavy against him, had herself forbidden the attempt. This was all the solution she had to offer Mr. Aspinall, in the excitement of the accident and the rescue, she had overlooked Augusta's excessive emotion, but now her mother's heart took alarm. Could it be that the younger eyes of Jabus had seen a preference for the handsome scapegrace which she had not? The matter was talked over by husband and wife long after Mr. Aspinall had left, and the anxious mother questioned the maiden in the privacy of her own room to come thence with the sad conviction 
that Augusta had prematurely been led captive by a handsome face and a dashing hair, irrespective of worth or worthlessness. Yet she consoled herself and Mr. Ashton with the reflection, it is, after all, only a girlish fancy, and will die out. Just so, and as the young rake is laid by the leg for one while, there is all the more chance, assented Mr. Ashton. If his immersion does not convert him into a hero, added the matron, with a clearer knowledge of her daughter, yet neither asked themselves how the intuitive perception of Jabus came to be more acute than their own, nor what power impelled him to risk his life for an enemy at the mere bidding of Augusta. Indeed, they set the hazardous exploit down to the score of magnanimity and bravery only. Equally unobservant were they of Ellen Chadwick's remonstrance, or her feverish watch of every perilous turn Jabus and Nelson had taken on the ice, or of the caresses she lavished on the dog when all was over. Only Mrs. Chadwick had seen that, as she had seen fainter signs years before, but she held her peace, and, having eleven of her sister's pride, hoped she was mistaken. There were three young hearts consumed by the same passion, that which lies at the roots of the happiness or misery of the world, one nursing the romance, two fighting against its hopelessness in silence and concealment. But the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Jabez Clegg could not tell when he had not loved Augusta Ashton. From the time when she was young enough to play about the ware-rooms, or to be lifted across the muddy roadways in his strong apprentice arms, when it was his pleasant duty to protect her to and from school. But he could trace back the time when Ogar's prince gave to that love a definite shape, and he began to look upon his master's daughter as a prize to be attained. All things had tended to confirm his belief in its possibility, and love and ambition had gone hand in hand and fed each other. The child had come to him for companionship and entertainment. The girl under his protection had confided to him her school-day troubles, and come to him for help in difficulties, with lessons on slate or book. She had looked up to him, trusted him, clung to him, and though she was as a star in his firmament, he had had a sort of vague impression that the star which shone upon him from afar would draw nearer, and, as he rose to it, come down to meet him. His first sharp awakening was her reminder that the pair of intoxicated officers who had insulted her in the theatre were gentlemen, and so not to be chastised by him. His second, and then jealousy added a sting, was meeting Aspinall face to face in the hall when the latter smilingly bowed himself out on his first visit, and now he brooded in despair over the final dissipation of his dream beneath the icicle-hung boughs on Hardwick Green, for the first time conscious that she belonged to another sphere. Never by look or word had he done himself, or her, or her parents, the dishonour of giving expression to his ambitious love, and now another had looked on his divinity, and won her for himself. It came upon him like a flash, when that white-faced agony, that piteous cry, called him to imperil his own life, worthless in the scale against another, and that other. It came upon him with a flash that scathed like lightning. He had forgiven the boy Aspin all long ago, and the man, well, Augusta's happiness demanded the sacrifice, and he had made it. Out of his very love for Augusta, he had saved the rival's life she had prayed for, and he had been offered money for the act which wrecked his own life. Thank God! He'd rejected it with scorn. A kind hand laid on his shoulder interrupted a reverie which had induced torpor. Mr. Clegg, you are ill. Your cold requires attention. You had better seek repose. You are quite feverish. Repose. The man's soul was on fire as well as his body. Yet from his chamber, a fortnight later, emerged a grave businessman, without an apparent thought beyond the warehouse. And what of Lawrence Aspinall, whom we left with closed eyes wrapped in blankets on a sofa? He had hung suspended in the water for an hour by the clock in the tower of St. Thomas's ivy-clad church, and, 
Notwithstanding, he had kept his limbs and the water in motion so long as he had power. The chill had extended upwards, and though life had been called back, sight and reason were in abeyance. Shorn of his rich curls, for weeks he raved and struggled in the grasp of brain fever, and old Kitty, forgetting everything but her promise to his dead mother, watched and tended him night and day, albeit nurses from the fever ward relieved each other in their well-paid care of him. The frost was gone. Vegetation bound so long had leapt upwards from its chains. Lilacs and maybuds greeted him with perfume through the open windows, and even the daffodil and narcissus sent up their incense from the brim of the garden pond when he began to show signs of amendment. Better, much better, were the answers to inquiries, among whom may be cited Kit Townley and Bob, their sometime groom. But the lilac and the hawthorn ripened and faded, and the daffodils gave place to the wallflower and carnation, and the rosebuds opened their ripe lips to June, yet the rich cotton merchant's son saw nothing of the glow. Over the blue eyes of Lawrence the lids were closed, and not an oculist in the town had skill to open them. Dr. Hull, the consulting physician of the eye institution, and his surgical colleagues, Messrs. Wilson and Travers, had laid their heads together over a case peculiar in all its bearings, but the lids remained obstinately shut. At length, when Hope had folded her drooping wings in despair, and Mr. Aspinall was borne down with grief for his sightless son, someone suggested that as water had done the mischief, water in action might cure it. "'Can he swim?' asked rough Dr. Hull, curtly of Kitty. "'Swim? Aye, he can do out he shouldn't do,' replied the old woman having no faith in the value of her charge's peculiar accomplishments. Is he a good swimmer? I reckon so. He used to swim for wages in Hardy Green Pond when he were quite a little chap. That will do. Mr. Aspinall was conferred with, and the next day's mail coach took the blind patient, his father, Kitty, and one of the surgeons to Liverpool. After a night's rest at the York Hotel, they were driven down to St. George's Pier, a very humble presentment of what it is in this our day. Like Manchester, Liverpool has vastly swelled in size and importance within the last fifty years, and her docks have grown with the shipping needing shelter. The Mersey was not the crowded highway it is now. There were fewer ships and no steamers to cross each other's track and set the waters in commotion, defying wind and tide. Mr. Aspinall had engaged a boat to be in readiness, the sightless athlete was rowed a short distance from curious spectators on the pier, and then, his face being turned towards Birkenhead, he plunged into the swelling river, which he breasted like a triton, so welcome and native seemed the element to him. And as the salt wave buoyed him up or dashed over his cropped head, he appeared to gain fresh strength with every stroke. Anxiously his three attendants followed in his wake, lest cramp should seize him, or his impaired strength give out before the river, there rather more than a mile in breadth could be crossed, yet not a yard of the distance baited he. By instruction he had bent his course slightly downstream, so as to meet the opposing tide, then rolling in with a freshet. He struck out boldly, the very dash of the salt waves invigorating him as they broke over his bare pole, or laved his naked limbs. Still well in advance of the boat, he seemed at last to cross the current as a conqueror. He touched the shore at Rock Ferry, and, miracle of miracles, his eyes were opened. Lawrence Aspinall, who for weeks had cursed his darkened existence, could once more see. Chapter 31 Coronation Day Misfortune binds closer than prosperity. The calamity which tied Lawrence Aspinall down in a straight waistcoat to a bed of fever with shaven head and sightless eyes touched the Ashtons in a tender point. Themselves the parents of an only child, the very crown and glory of their lives, their sympathies went forth to Mr. Aspinall in spite of his haughty assumption. Indeed, distress brought him down to the common level of humanity, and having neither sister, aunt, nor cousin to undertake the care of his sick son, for love and not for fee, he learned the comparative powerlessness of wealth 
and hailed with all the gratitude in his nature the occasional visits of Mrs. Ashton, in whose stately bearing, no doubt, he recognised a sort of kinship. It was, however, not Mrs. Ashton the businesswoman, not Mrs. Ashton the lofty lady, but Mrs. Ashton the mother, who laid her cool hand on the young man's fevered forehead, questioned the nurses, made suggestions for the benefit of the invalid, and by means of a lady's free registry in Chapel Walk, found a staid woman of experience to act as housekeeper and bring the disorganised household into order without treading on the toes of attached but incapable Kitty. The head of Antonia shone of its glorious locks, swathed in lotion cloths, tossed in delirium, would scarcely appear so attractive as to fill the most timid mother with fears for a romantic daughter's heart, and so while sympathy was awake, vigilance slumbered. Yet never need vigilance have been more awake she saw him as he was, Augusta as he had been. Through other channels than the maternal, she heard of his condition from day to day, and how, in his delirium, he had mixed up her name with the slang of the cockpit, the race course and the prize ring, but with strange infatuation she ignored all that should have warned, and clung to all that was pleasant to her own self-love. Never had she been so assiduous in her visits to her Aunt Chadwick and her cousin Wormsley, and her smiling, I brought my work and come to sit with you this afternoon. Should have been translated. I hope John or Mr. Travis will drop in. They're sure to have something to say about Mr. Lawrence. It is so dreadful not to know how he is going on. And pretty generally, her calculations were correct. The two gentlemen were interested in Aspinall as a member of their yeomanry corps, apart from private friendship, and were constant in their inquiries, even finding their way to his bedside and Mr. Benjamin Travis, who could not very well every day manage to meet Mr. Chadwick accidentally on his way from the warehouse and lend his stout arm as a support, appeared only too glad to be the bearer of bulletins from Hardwick as an excuse for calling in Oldham Street and hovering about the chair or the window where Ellen Chadwick sat at her sewing or knitting and grew silent on his entrance, blushing when she heard his footstep or his voice in the hall from motives sadly misinterpreted. There was no mistaking the true purport of his frequent visits and deciduous attention to the crippled old gentleman. So Augusta, having settled in her own mind that Helen was either too reserved or too shy to give her big, good-natured but timid lover proper encouragement, took upon herself to play into his hands and make opportunities for his wooing. What a delightful afternoon for a walk! Whether he or she made the observation, the other was sure to assent, and then wilful Miss Augusta, unaccustomed to be gainsaid, and seconded by her aunt, also a secret ally of Ben Travis, would drag her cousin forth in defiance of any excuse or protestation to the undisguised satisfaction of their magnificent cavalier. It was remarkable that on these occasions, whether they took their way up Pancoats or Dale Street or Piccadilly or Garrett Road, they would eventually be led so near to Hardwick Green that it would have been unkind had not Mr. Travis just stepped across to see how Mr. Lawrence progressed. And so too, whenever she went abroad with Cicely at her heels, or when Cicely was sent on errands, nothing would content her imperative young mistress but that she should hasten, whether in her way or out of it, with Mrs. Ashton's compliments, to ascertain the condition of the invalid's scapegrace. Many a scolding did breathless Sicily get, in consequence, from angry Kezia, the queen of the kitchen, which Augusta paid her messenger for with coins or ribbons or kerchiefs or smooth words, as might be most convenient at the time. And Mrs. Ashton was accredited by the Aspinalls with a degree of attention never contemplated by herself. But there was one person in the house Augusta avoided from that afternoon at the end of March, when her fascinating hero would have lost his life, but for a much humbler hero, of less pretensions and fewer attractions, she might have been blind as father and mother to his attachment until that afternoon, but that one wild, impassioned, agonised look of Jabus into her eyes had opened them forever. She felt she had tasked him beyond human endurance, and was ashamed to look him in the face. The presumption of the ex-apprentice paled before his devotion and self-abnegation, 
but self-conscious after that first outburst of thanks on the green, she had shrunk from meeting him in all or on staircase, and had always a reason ready why he should not be invited to their own tea table when father or mother proposed it. Public events march on, irrespective of private joys or sorrows, and no individual goes out into the world after three months' seclusion to find things just as he left them. The first use Lawrence Aspinall made of his eyes was to look at himself in a mirror, the second, on his return to Manchester, to select a substitute for the clustering curls of which he had been despoiled. Closely shut in the carriage, which Mr. Ashton had lightly designated a box, he was driven down Market Street to discover that the spirit of improvement fell bane of all that's picturesque, had touched the ancient, many gabled black and white houses with which his earliest recollections were associated, and they were crumbling into dusty ruins before the potent incantation space. It was the beginning of a very necessary widening of the main thoroughfares of the growing commercial metropolis, but the blanks in the narrow street took Lawrence by surprise. There was a newspaper the more for his restored sight to scan, albeit the Manchester Guardian, which Jeremiah Garnett and John Edward Taylor first gave to the world on the 5th of May, was scarcely likely to take his view of party politics, or of his share in the Peterloo massacre, which was still a disturbing element in the town. Just now the paper, which he found at the wig makers, was given over to the discussion of the approach and coronation of George IV, which likewise formed the theme of conversation, not only at the wig makers, but whithersoever he turned when once more presentable. Somehow, though, he found his way to the warehouse and the cockpit and the assembly billiard club and to Tib Street, where Bob the groom had a pretty daughter, very much at the young man's disposal. He did not present himself at his Mosley Street friends as soon as might have been expected, considering all things, and Augusta in the most becoming of morning robes, watching with eager expectation for his coming, began to pant and chill with the sickness of hope deferred. He was by no means the only admirer of the lovely heiress, and was sufficiently desirous to complete his conquest before other competitors were fairly in the field. But he was in perplexity how to deal with Jabez Clegg, who stood in his way after another sort. He was grateful after a fashion for the preservation of his life, but ungrateful, inasmuch as Jabez was the preserver. Hang it, said he, in conference with himself, as he tied on a neckcloth at the glass. If the fellow had but taken the five hundred pounds, there'd have been an end of it, and one could have wiped one's hands of him. What right had the beggarly charity boy to refuse a reward, as if he were a gentleman, I should like to know. I wonder what Kit Townley and Wormsley were about, the cowardly ninnies, to let an upstart like that pull me out of the hole, and almost as leaf had been drowned, and away he went a small cravat across the room in his temper, and he rummaged for a fresh one, to the detriment of linen, as he went on. There's one thing positive, I must either bring down my pride, I'll give up the girl and be damned to it. That old Ashton, with his just so like a cooker, would certainly shut the door in my face if I neglected to make a set speech and thank his precious protégé, who knocks you down with one hand and picks you up with the other. Well, I don't feel inclined to surrender the finest girl in Lancashire, and with such a fortune as she'll have, so I'm in for it. I must make a virtue of necessity. Egad, I'll write to this Mr. Clegg. No, I won't. It will be a feather in his cap to have a thanksgiving letter of mine to exhibit. Having at length determined his course, Mr. Lawrence betook himself to Mosley Street, made his bow duly and gracefully to Mrs. Ashton and the young lady, keeping the hand of the latter as long within his own as etiquette would permit, and sending the warm blood mantling to her cheek with a supplicating glance of devotion as potent as words. Then, with some little prolixity, he professed his desire to thank his noble preserver for the life he had saved, and at his request Mr. Clegg, whom he might just as well have thanked in the warehouse without ceremony, was sent for. Coming into the parlour, all unwittingly as he did, to find Lawrence Aspinall, handsome as ever, and more interesting from illness, standing under the lacquered serpent chandelier in close proximity to Augusta, 
sparkling with animation and blushing like the rose he had just offered her with a pretty smile. His emotion so overmastered him that the polished gentleman had him at a disadvantage and shone in comparison. Both August and the mother noted the contrast between the elegant manner, suave tones and rounded periods of Lawrence Aspinall's thanks and the curt disclaimer of Jabus. Though their deductions were different, Augusta was in raptures with the rose giver. Ah, my dear, all is not gold that glitters. There is more sterling metal in your father's salesman, mark my words, than in the tinsel lieutenant, was the summing up of the elder, as she replaced cake and wine in sideboard and cellaret. She was clearly no friend to Aspinall, now that he had recovered sense and sight. The town, which had been strong and outspoken in its condemnation during the trial of Queen Caroline, was now all alive with preparations to celebrate its coronation with befitting magnificence, one branch of trade vying with another which should make the greatest display in the coming procession to the green, the like of which never had been and never would be again. And this competition, productive of marvellous results, due in a great measure to trade rivalry and an ambitious desire to outshine, was set down by historians, rightly or wrongly, as a proof of the excessive loyalty of the Mancestrians. In all classes, from the highest to the lowest, something was being done, and nothing was talked of, thought of, dreamed of, but the coronation and the procession. In courts and alleys there were making and mending and washing, and no little pinching was undergone by hard-working fathers and mothers to provide the girls with white cambric frocks, tippets and neckcaps, or the lads with fresh jackets and breeches and shoes, so as not to disgrace the Sunday schools, under whose banners they were to walk. The finest horses of the old key company and Pitfords were put into new harness, and the finest condition, and every lorry, a long, flat, sideless wagon, was called into requisition. Smiths, saddlers, sign and scene painters were at work day and night for weeks, and such was the request for banners that ladies undertook the work when skill labour was not to be found. The important ceremony was fixed for the 19th of July. On the 17th, a deputation of small ware weavers waited on Mr. Ashton in despair. They could get neither flag nor banner. The painter had thrown over the order at the last moment. And Tommy Worthington's getting a finer, master. It'll be a shame and a disgrace to us if we let Worthington's cut us out. The said Worthington was a rival small ware manufacturer. Mr. Ashton had recourse to his snuff-box, and then to his wife. "'My dear, what is to be done? There will be no flag. The painters cannot execute the jobs in hand. Worthington's have a fine one, I hear.' "'No flag? That will never do. We must have a flag. Let me consider.' Helen Chadwick was busy helping Augusta to make favours for the men. She looked up. "'Do you not think Mr. Clegg could paint you one?' she suggested. Mr. Ashton brightened, but his just-so was nipped in the bud by the recollection that there was no time. "'Where there's a will, there's a way,' said Mrs. Ashton, and sought out Jabus. "'It is quite out of my line, but I can try. It would be a pity to disappoint the men,' answered he. "'And nothing beats trying but doing,' added Mrs. Ashton. Silk and colours were procured, there was no leisure for complex design or elaboration. At that time the dark blue covers of the Dutch tapes in gross bore the symbolic device of the flax plant within a rude scroll. This Jabez transferred in colours to his silk on a colossal scale, both sides bearing the same emblem of their trade, more effective on its completion than any elaborate work. He had bargained to be left without interruption. The men fidgeted about the warehouse in a state of nervous trepidation. It was an important matter to them. But at dawn, on the 19th, it was finished, and borne off by the weavers in triumph and exultation. Market Street Lane, being in ruins at one end, and a narrow gully at the other, Mosley Street became the natural course for the procession, two miles and a half in length, from Petersfield to the Green, where a royal salute was to be fired and like every other house on the line of route, 
Mr. Ashton's was filled with guests, and from garret to basement every window had its streamer, and was crowded with gaily dressed spectators, mostly feminine, the gentlemen of the town taking part in the procession, officially or otherwise. The Chadwicks and Mrs. Walmsley were there, of course, and Mrs. Clough, amongst others, and on another floor Jabez, who being above the warehouseman and not a master, did not walk, had as a companion good Bess Hume, who with her husband had come over from Whaley Bridge, where there was, of course, a holiday. To Tom had been assigned the honour of chief standard bearer. In all such processions the military element, with its brilliant uniforms and stirring music, prevails, but here, where every item of the cavalcade had its own brass band, were also all the dignitaries of the church, with every silver badge of office resplendently burnished for the occasion. The borough reeve and other magistrates and constabulary in new uniforms, the lamplighters with new smocks carrying their ladders and cans, the firemen and fire engines, bright as paint and polish could make them, the gentlemen of the town, all with favours, the Sunday school children, marshalled under their respective banners or tablets, walking six abreast, the ladies' jubilee school, the green coat school and the blue coat school, on which Jabez looked down with curiously mingled feelings. But the marked feature of the magnificent procession was the display made by the trades with their banners, a lorry accompanying each, bearing well-dressed workmen and machines in full operation. At the head of these came two figures representing Adam and Eve in a perfect bower of greenery, as representatives of the primitive condition before dress was invented. They were followed by a lorry on which tailors, whose art is the first on record, sat cross-legged and stitched and pressed, as if on a shopboard, whilst a select band of journeymen walked after, bearing miniature garments on wands or ferruginous geese and sleeveboards. The blacksmiths wrought on their anvil, and carried also on long poles, horseshoes, etc. The brass and coppersmiths, likewise at work, had a bright array of kettles, candlesticks, and a mounted man in armour, as had also the tin plate workers. The glass blowers made a goodly array, and gave away tokens as they went. The men wore hats and caps, brittle and brilliant, with wavy plumes of spun glass, whilst birds, ships, goblets, and decanters on their poles glistened in the beams of the hot sun. A printing press distributed appropriate verses, worked off in the course of the procession, and St. Crispin's followers waxed their threads and plied their awls on boots and shoes as they and their benches were borne along followed by their leather-aproned fraternity, holding aloft their productions from the most gigantic of Wellingtons to the tiniest infant slipper. All branches of the cotton trade were represented. There was cotton in bags, twist in bales, carding, roving, spinning, weaving, all going on under the eyes of the onlookers, with the work people following in their best and brightest. Shouts and hurrahs attended the whole line of march, not wholly unaccompanied by hisses. But as the small ware weavers passed Mr. Ashton's, the cheers were deafening. A loom was at work weaving lengths of binding for garters, on which was inwoven, God save King George the Fourth with the date, and these were lifted on long wands to the ladies at the windows on their way, or scattered to others in the street, and as Tom Hume caught the eye of Jabez, he pointed proudly to their banner, which had no rival in all the elaborately painted flags waving in the wind, and the impromptu artist was well satisfied but the brightest day has its cloud. As the Manchester yeomanry went prancing past, Travis and Walmsley alike saluted the ladies at the drawing-room window, but to the pain of Jabus and the indignation of Mrs. Ashton, Lawrence Aspinall had the audacity to kiss his hand to Augusta 